managing different views in the workplace, uh, just in terms of setting the scene. Um, I'm going to be joined today by Hazel Coots, who is one of our senior associates. Uh, Hazel is not only a lawyer, but also uh, has a professional background in HR and is a member of the CIPD. Uh, so hopefully that gives her uh, a well-balanced perspective on some of these issues. Um, as I'm sure lots of you know, uh, we're working in an ever more polarised society. Uh, I Personally, uh, I think social media has driven a lot of that. Um, it's become a platform for strong, uh, sometimes extreme expressions of views. And uh, it feels as if that's then filtered out into our television and our radio and other forms of media. And we've kind of reached the stage where even children's books are having to be written to try to train children in how to disagree with each other. And if anyone's looking for a good book, and I have to say, I think it's a good book for any age, although it's written specifically for young kids, Matthew Said's book, uh, What Do You Think, uh, is a brilliant read to try to contextualise how important it is for us to be able to disagree with each other, but not, not fall out. So we've got that as one backdrop. Uh, and then the other backdrop is the, the, the diversity agenda, the diversity challenge. Um, we're told very recently that, uh, in fact, we probably shouldn't be referring to the term equality, and we should actually be referring to the term equity, uh, recognising that within society and within the world, uh, some people are more disadvantaged than others. And so applying an equal treatment to everyone is not necessarily fair or, in fact, uh, desirable. Currently in the UK, other than in disability law, where I'm sure, as we all know, there are uh, positive steps that we as employers uh, and work givers have to take in order to alleviate disadvantages that, that disabled people may, uh, may have to overcome. Uh, and then some other limited areas. So the tie break provisions in recruitment and where an organisation has identified that there's an under-representation, under uh, taking targeted steps to try to improve that level of representation. The way that UK employment law principally approaches diversity, to try to use a, a neutral phrase, is through the concept of equality. The main act is called the Equality Act, not the Equity Act. Uh, and although some of the cases that we'll have a look at it, illustrate the fact that it's it's very difficult to deal with conflicting views where we as a society have taken uh, a perspective that those views should be protected. What is very clear uh, is that no one belief or religion or set of views uh, can be given priority over others under the Equality Act. So for the purposes of looking at this part uh, of the Equality Act and how we as employers should try to manage the issues that it can cause, uh, there is no hierarchy of protection. Um, we are being drawn into these, these disputes um, more and more. Certainly we as lawyers are finding ourselves involved in them more and more. Uh, they don't just apply to employees because, of course, the Equality Act uh, has a much broader reach than the Employment Rights Act. So some of these concepts apply to others who might work within or even for our organisations. And the way that the law has tried to develop uh, its thinking on which views should be protected and how is illustrated a little by this setting the scene slide. Uh, I'm not going to talk you through the pictures, uh, a little mini test for anyone who is uh, already super familiar with this part of the law. You will probably be able to link each of these pictures with uh, a recent case on religious or philosophical belief. Uh, if you can't, don't worry. Uh, Hazel is going to talk us through uh, a lot of the cases and if any have not been covered by the end of the session, we can wrap up at the end and I'll make sure that we've linked all the pictures to something relevant to what we're talking about. So Hazel's gonna take us off uh, now, just looking at how we identify protected beliefs. And then also very importantly, 
what level of protection is given not only to the belief, which in most cases is relatively straightforward, but to the much more difficult question of what protection is given to the manifestation or the demonstration or the practicing of that belief, which is really where the, the laws struggled a lot more. Uh, I'll then come back in with some key takeaways. Uh, we'll also have a look at some cases that show where employers have got this wrong. Uh, and then uh, I'll get, leave you with some ideas to let you test your own workplace's approach to this uh, against, and we'll have a short time for questions at the end. We're definitely going to finish at one o'clock. And in order to make that happen, I will immediately hand over to Hazel. Thanks very much, Tony. So we've all got different backgrounds and experiences that shape our perception of the world, and diversity is very important. We know that diverse teams can boost creativity and innovation and give your business the competitive edge. But differing views can also affect relationships, as you know, and lead to conflict at work. So we're going to look at a number of recent tribunal decisions that have highlighted the difficulties faced by employers when managing different views in the workplace. The Equality Act it protects a wide range of individuals against discrimination, including because of, as Tony says, the religion or belief. But should a conflict at work arise, it's really important to consider whether an individual's views may be afforded protection under the Equality Act before taking any action. This will help mitigate the risk of grievances and successful employment tribunal claims arising. So employers might feel fairly confident in identifying a religious belief, but what amounts to a philosophical belief can sometimes be quite difficult to determine. The definition of a belief under Section 10 of the Equality Act does not provide us with much insight, really. It simply states that belief means any religious or philosophical belief, and reference to belief includes a reference to lack of belief. But fortunately, in the case of Granger and Nicholson, the Employment Appeal Tribunal provided some guidance to assist. It sets out five criteria that must be met if a belief is to be afforded protection under the legislation. So as you can see in the slide, firstly, the belief must be genuinely held. It must be a belief and not an opinion or viewpoint. It must be a belief as to a weighty and substantial aspect of human life and behaviour. It must attain a certain level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion and importance. And finally, it must be worthy of respect in a democratic society, not incompatible with human dignity and not conflict with the fundamental rights of others. So to help put this in context, we're going to look at some cases and how the courts have applied the criteria in Granger. In the case of Granger itself, the claimant argued that he had a philosophical belief that mankind is heading towards catastrophic climate change, and therefore we're all under a duty to lead our lives in a, manager in a manner which mitigates or avoids this catastrophe for the, the benefit of future generations, and he thought we, were, we should persuade others to do the same. And the EAT held in that case that environmentalism and a belief in climate change was capable of being a belief for the purposes of the UK anti-discrimination legislation. In another case, the case of Hashman in Milton Park, an employment tribunal held that a belief in the sanctity of life extending to an anti-fox hunting and anti-hair coursing belief also constituted a philosophical belief. In the case of McElhenney in the Ministry of Defence, an employment tribunal held that an employee's genuine and deeply held belief in Scottish independence amounted to a philosophical belief under the Equality Act. In applying the Granger criteria, the tribunal held that Mr McElhenney's belief in Scottish independence was not an opinion or viewpoint, but it was a fundamental belief in the right of Scotland to national sovereignty which concerned a weighty and substantial aspect of human life and behaviour and had a sufficient level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion and importance to be a philosophical belief. Mr McLean also held a belief in the social democratic values of the Scottish National Party. However, the tribunal didn't accept that this amounted to a philosophical belief under the Equality Act. 
they held that this particular belief was a manifestation of his fundamental belief in Scottish independence. And his support for the SNP was because of its commitment to Scottish independence. In the case of Conisby and Crossley Farms, an employment tribunal held that vegetarianism, perhaps surprisingly, was not a belief qualifying for protection under the Equality Act. Although Mr Conisby's vegetarian belief was genuinely held, it was worthy of respect in democratic society, the tribunal decided that it didn't concern a weighty and substantial aspect of human life, but instead was rather a, a lifestyle choice. And they said it didn't attain the level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion and importance required to meet the test in Granger. It is fair to say, though, that many of the tribunal decisions are very much based on the facts of the particular case and to what extent the belief affects how a person lives their lives. So because a philosophical belief has been held to be protected by one tribunal, it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be held to be protected by another. There have been a few conflicting decisions in relation to religion and belief discrimination. In the case of Kazimichana, an employment tribunal held that ethical veganism could amount to a protected philosophical belief because it attained a high level of cogency, cohesion and importance. There was no conflict between veganism and human dignity and ethical veganism did not in any way offend society or conflict with the fundamental rights of others. However, in contrast, in the case of Free Miles and the Royal Veterinary College, an employment tribunal decided that a belief in ethical, ethical veganism did not amount to philosophical belief. Um, and that was because in this case, the claimant claimed that her belief included a positive obligation to break the law to reduce animal suffering, which included trespassing and property and the removal of animals. In that case, the tribunal said that had Miss Free Miles believed Ethical, had her belief in ethical veganism been limited to a belief that humans shouldn't eat or wear or use for sport, experiment on or profit from animals, it would have had no reservation in concluding that this amounted to a philosophical belief. However, a belief to take unlawful actions could not be worthy of respect in a democratic society. So in this instance, the belief didn't satisfy the fifth criterion in Granger. So if you've joined us um, for some of our previous webinars, you'll be familiar with the case of Forstatter and CGD Europe. In this case, Ms. Forstatter was a visiting fellow at the Centre for Global Development. Her contract was not re renewed after she expressed a series of gender critical views online. One of the preliminary issues that had to be decided in that case was whether Ms. Forstatter's belief that sex is immutable and should not be conflated with gender identity qualified for protection under the Equality Act. And at first instance, the Employment Tribunal found that Ms. Forstatter's beliefs were incompatible with human dignity and the fundamental rights of others, and thus fell foul of the fifth criterion in Granger. However, at the EAT, they said that the, the Equality Act requires to be interpreted in line with the human rights enshrined in the European Convention of Human Rights, which in particular entitles people to freedom of thought, conscience and religion, so that's under Article 9, and also freedom of expression under Article 10. So there was some discussion as to whether Article 17, which prevents any person from relying on the terms of the European Convention of Human Rights as a means of destroying the rights and freedoms of others, whether that would prevent Ms. Forstatter's belief from qualifying for protection. But ultimately, the EAT held that while her beliefs may have been considered, and I quote, offensive and abhorrent to some, the only beliefs which would fail to qualify for protection as a result of Article 17 would be those that were akin to totalitarianism, Nazism, or espoused violence or hatred in the gravest forms. So it follows therefore that beliefs which are disturbing, offensive, or even shocking to others can still be worthy of respect in a democratic society, and therefore can still qualify for protection under the Equality Act. <clears throat> The Equality and Human Rights Commission guide, it says that on religion belief, an employer should only question a belief in the most exceptional circumstances where, for example, it's very obscure, appears to be 
objectively unreasonable or the sincerity of the belief of, of an employee's in doubt. So although a wide variety of beliefs might be afforded protection under the Equality Act, this doesn't necessarily mean that individuals holding protected beliefs can manifest their beliefs with impunity. And a distinction has been made in the case law between, for example, individuals holding or not holding a religious belief or a philosophical belief and the inappropriate manifestation of that belief. So where the reason for the less favorable treatments, so for example, taking disciplinary action is the fact that an individual holds a protected belief, this will amount to direct discrimination. But placing limitations on a person's right to manifest their religion or belief may amount to unlawful discrimination. So where, for example, an individual's manifested their belief in some objectionable way, it might be possible to defend the claim on the basis that the inappropriate manifestation of that belief, not the belief itself, which is the reason for the, for the unfavourable treatment. And whether the individual's manifestation of their belief is inappropriate should be tested by reference to Article 9 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which provides that a freedom to manifest one's religion and belief shall be subject only to such limitations as prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society in the interest of public safety, for the protection of public order, health or morals, or for the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. In the case of Page and the Lord Chancellor, the Court of Appeal upheld the tribunal's decision that a Christian magistrate who was removed after he spoke to the press about his views on same-sex couple adoption was not victimised for having alleged religious discrimination. Rather, he was dismissed for having spoken to the press against judicial guidance, thereby flouting his judicial oath of impartiality and potentially bringing the judiciary into disrepute. In another case of Higgs and Farmer's School, Mrs Higgs, a Christian employed in the school, was dismissed following several Facebook posts which she'd reshared and added some comments to, which were considered offensive due to their homophobic and transphobic nature. The tribunal in that case found that Mrs Higgs' lack of belief in gender fluidity and lack of belief that someone could change their biological sex were worthy of respect in a democratic society and therefore were afforded protection under the Equality Act. However, in that case, the tribunal considered that Mrs Higgs had not been discriminated against because of her protected belief, but she had been disciplined and dismissed because of the nature of those posts, which went much further than those beliefs and could have let, read, led to a reader believing that she was homophobic or transphobic. So, what can we learn from the case law? I'll, I'll hand you back to Tony now, who's going to look at some of the key takeaways. Yeah, little visual gag on the slide. Um, there is absolutely no connection to KFC, McDonald's or Nando's other than the word takeaway, um, I think, which is um, where you're dealing with an issue which is related to somebody's belief. Uh, the first thing is to be extremely respectful of the belief, but be prepared to potentially uh, distinguish between the belief and the manifestation of that belief. And manifestation in itself is a very difficult concept, and particularly the four starter case has told us that um, the mere inverted commas statement uh, of a philosophical or religious belief might be quite difficult to take action in connection with. Um, so it may have to be more of a manifestation, uh, more inappropriate. Um, and we'll have a look at some cases that help us with that in a second. Um, and really, that's the key takeaway from, I think, those manifestation cases, which is you have to very carefully consider at what point the line was crossed. Um, so let's have a look at some of those cases. Um, the first one, uh, McClintock. So uh, Mr. McClintock uh, was a justice of the peace uh, who was, or um, I think he was to do, he, he had, had to do with placing children uh, into uh, a, various adoption environments. And he was not persuaded that it was in a child's best interest to be placed with a same-sex 
couple. And he wrote a number of emails saying, I don't think this is necessarily right. I don't think there's been enough research into this. I think this is a social experiment. And so he asked to be exempted from cases where he might have to decide that a child would be placed with a, with a same-sex couple. Uh, the, the relevant department said no. Uh, and later in the dialogue, he referenced his Christian beliefs. And there was no dispute about the fact that he was a Christian. Uh, he, he, he eventually resigned and then brought a claim in connection with the, the, the resignation or the removal from office. The claim was unsuccessful. And the reason why it was mainly unsuccessful was because um, he hadn't at the beginning connected his request for an exemption to his religious belief. So he was expressing an opinion or a viewpoint. He said there needs to be more uh, research done into this. And the uh, whole judicial system uh, was against him on that, because once a law has been made by a parliament, a legislature, a judge has a judicial oath to implement that law. The time to question whether the law is the right thing to do or not is at the point that it's democratically scrutinized by the legislature. So it, having sort of got to that point, I think he, he was probably always going to lose. But that's a really useful case that shows that um, a belief in something is not the same as expressing an opinion. So carefully and respectfully exploring that with somebody is really important. And this next case, uh, Mbuyi, which was about a, an evangelical Christian uh, childcare worker who worked uh, with a, 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 an openly lesbian colleague, uh, and the evangelical Christian Miss Mbuyi uh, gave various of her colleagues Bibles and was quite proactive about her belief in Christianity. Uh, she then, and she was very friendly with her lesbian colleague. There was no personal animosity between them until a conversation which ended up getting out of hand where the lesbian colleague asked Miss Mbuyi whether she would be welcomed into her church. And Miss Mbuyi said, well, no, because um, God believes that you're a sinner. And the conversation escalated from there, leaving the lesbian colleague very upset. And she made a complaint. Miss Mbuyi ultimately was disciplined for not only that conversation, but also giving employees Bibles and various other things, which nobody had actually complained about at the time. And the employer in investigating the issue seemed to have become very emotionally protective of the lesbian colleague who had been legitimately upset by a difficult conversation. But the lesbian colleague had herself challenged Miss Mbuyi's perspective on Christianity and God and various aspects of her belief and so Ms. Mbuyi had challenged the lesbian's belief in same-sex relationships. The lesbian had challenged Ms. Mbuyi's belief in uh, her form of Christianity. Both beliefs were protected, but only Ms. Mbuyi was disciplined and investigated. And because of that, and also because the employer didn't, for example, ask Ms. Mbuyi and the colleague whether they could refrain from those conversations in the future and give an undertaking and perhaps work together. They just dismissed Ms. Mbuyi. Uh, the, the disciplinary action was found both to be direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. So that case, it's only a tribunal uh, decision, but it's a really great read and all tribunal decisions are available on the website. If you'd like to have a look at how an employer well-meaning uh, got it wrong by jumping too quickly to the defense of the allegedly slighted employee. That's a great example of it. Um, Ali uh, is uh, a case where an employer was trying to run a reasonable steps defense. That's a defense that says, well, we sort of accept that somebody did something bad, but we, the employer, are not going to take responsibility for it. We're going to say that we took all reasonable steps to prevent discrimination of this kind happening. And they referred to the training that they had put in place uh, in their workplace. And actually the training was reasonably comprehensive. So they had an equal opportunities policy. They had an anti-bullying and harassment process. They delivered training in 2015 uh, on equality and diversity. And they'd also delivered bullying and harassment training later that year. They hadn't refreshed it. It wasn't live. And the EAT found that they couldn't rely on the reasonable steps defense because they hadn't been refreshing the training. So that highlights the importance generally of uh, ensuring that equality and diversity training is, is updated. Redfern um, 
is an example of a case where a, a member of the BNP uh, was subjected to a detriment um, because there were concerns about the safety of providing the service in a predominantly uh, non-white area. It was known that he was a BNP member. And uh, ultimately, that resulted in a change to the Employment Rights Act, which says that where someone is dismissed for a reason related to their political opinion, uh, it is automatic. It's the the two year qualifying service period doesn't apply. That was looked at very recently up here in Scotland in the Scottish Housing Federation case, where an employee was dismissed from the Scottish Housing Federation because she wanted to stand as a candidate for the Labour Party. She said, this is you dismissing me for a political uh, opinion and also that it was a philosophical belief. She didn't win on the philosophical belief point and she didn't win on the political opinion point because she wasn't dismissed because of her political opinion. She was dismissed because the organisation had a policy of political neutrality and she wasn't prepared to adhere to that. So regardless of what political opinion she had, she would still have been dismissed. And that meant that Section 108 wasn't engaged. Some advice for employers, test, your, test yourselves against these. Um, key piece of advice, although I know some people find it contentious, the EHRC code, uh, key, key principle in the code, it says employers should treat all workers with dignity and respect. But not only that, employers should ensure that workers treat each other with dignity and respect. And I think particularly when you look at the Mbuyi case, you can see that some of her beliefs and the, her perspective on the world was not necessarily treated with the same dignity and respect that her lesbian colleagues' beliefs were. So there was an idea that she had attacked the lesbian colleague, but the lesbian colleague hadn't attacked her beliefs. And remember what I said about the beginning, at the beginning about those two beliefs, the belief in evangelical Christianity and the belief in, uh, and the protected characteristic of uh, homosexuality, uh, those are equal. So one can't trump the other. And I think that was probably where the employer fell down there. Um, have a policy, uh, an equal opportunities policy, an equality policy, maybe even an equity policy, if that's the direction of travel. Uh, in addition, I think it's useful to have an anti-harassment or bullying policy. And the reason why I say that is because the Equality Act applies wider than just your employees. So you do need to have a complaint process for people who aren't your employees and therefore might not have access to your grievance policy to deal with uh, anti-harassment and bullying issues that might come up from conflicting views. Publicize the policy and make sure you refer to it in inductions, make sure it's referred to in your handbook. Think about how you take on third party suppliers who might be in your building. Are they made aware of your perspective on equality, equity, diversity, anti-bullying and harassment? Uh, I don't know how many of you have this, but there's, there's a reference in the EHRC code to having uh, equality, equity, diversity, champions, um, and the EHRC has published a guide specifically in the context of being a gender champion, which has some really useful tips uh, about what a champion in the workplace might be and what they might do. Um, where beliefs are engaged, tread very carefully. Don't jump to conclusions. Make sure that those involved, and this includes us in the HR community, don't allow our, our own biases and our own perspective on the world to influence the way that you engage with different people. Um, that I think was my last piece of advice. It's just gone one o'clock. Um, anyone who's subscribed to Workbox, we've got some extra materials uh, on there. Uh, if you'd like to have a look at them. I'm just gonna look at the Q&A tab. Um, so question for Hazel. Um, how can veganism be protected when vegetarian, vegetarianism isn't? Yeah, so this, the answer to that was the tribunal looked at the sort of level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion um, that a vegetarians might have. And they said because vegetarians adopt the practice for many different reasons, so things like health, diet, personal taste, then that could be distinguished from veganism where the underlying motivation is, is fundamentally the same. Cool, that's super helpful. I promised you at the very beginning we'd stop at one. We've got one more question. It's a great question. Um, it's from Avril. Uh, is there not a fine line between opinion and belief? Avril, there absolutely is. And I think 
if you can accept that the law has not yet produced a set of criteria that work for every situation, and a lot of it is personal to the person that's holding that belief stroke opinion, um, because part of the assessment that the law has to do is work out whether the person is just holding an objectionable opinion that, that annoys someone else or, 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 or affronts them, or whether it's core to their real being. Uh, that's a kind of summary of, of what the law is trying to do. But that grey line between those two is very difficult. And as employers, where we're faced with having to examine the extent to which we may have to accommodate a belief that others or an opinion that others might find objectionable, sometimes you do have to very sensitively explore the extent to which it's part of that person's life. And um, the key thing, and again, I commend that and buoy decision to you, is to do that in as sensitive and open minded a way as possible. Um, I know that's easy for me to say. Uh, it's now two minutes past two. If there are any other questions, um, please feel free to email them to either myself, be super useful. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. It's been great to have you with us and we look forward to seeing you at the next one.